This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Uh, this is the third and uh, final lecture on Chapter 13, um, which is other financial ratios. I say other financial ratios because uh, we have already looked at some. If you think way back to Chapter 3, maybe, um, we looked at various working capital ratios. These ratios are specifically relating to uh, lenders, equity and uh, debt, financial ratios, the sorts of ratios that appear in the financial press. And to show what I mean, uh, example four, I've given you these statements of financial position, uh, 31st December for two years, 2002 and the previous year, 2001. Uh, it's all fairly conventional, but look at the finance. There's ordinary share capital, there are preference shares and reserves, uh, and there are debentures, uh, long-term loans. I've also given the statement of profit or loss for the two years. Uh, profit wedge and tax, the interest, the tax. So the net profits this year 34, last year 33, and there are dividends there, ordinary shares and preference shares. Uh, over the page I've given the market values, this year, last year, for the shares and for the debt. And it says calculate for each of the two years the following ratios. Uh, first of all, debt ratios. Um, remember, we already uh, know how to calculate gearing ratios, so I'm not repeating that. But the two ratios uh, relating to debt are, first of all, interest cover. Uh, An interest cover is the profit before interest and tax. divided by the interest. So before I say uh, uh, more about the relevance of it, check me on the figures. In 2002, the profit before interest and tax was 52,000. Uh, the interest was 6,000. So the interest cover, 52 divided by 6, is 8.67, and this we leave as a number, as a ratio. Whereas in 2001, the previous year, uh, profit before interest and tax was 49,000, interest 6,000, 49 divided by 6, 8.17. So on pure numbers, I hope that's clear, and obviously uh, learn it. The relevance of it is it tells us how easy it is for the uh, business to be paying the interest. Uh, what I mean is, look at it from two points of view. If you were a debt lender, what you're worried about um, is whether the company is going to continue to be able to pay interest. Uh, here, currently, their profits are eight, over eight times the interest. So even if profits were to fall in the future, they need to fall by a huge amount before they couldn't pay the interest. You know, if the interest cover was only one point something, then I might be rather scared. If profits were only 7,000, let's say, uh, because it would mean if profits fell next year, they wouldn't have to fall very much. And then they can't pay the interest, then we have a problem. Uh, shareholders are interested as well, because of course, if the company can't pay its interest, uh, then the company stands to have to close down. Well, again, there seems to be no problem here, but we're concerned about the future. But again, profits would have to fall enormously next year before they couldn't pay the interest and maybe we have to close. But that's why we're interested in it.
the lower it is, the more worried uh, the lenders are, the more worried the shareholders are. Uh, another um, figure debt lenders will be interested in is interest yield. Uh, and I did mention this in um, a previous chapter, so I shouldn't need to go on here. But you see, the coupon rate on the debentures on the debt is 6% from the statement of uh, financial position. Uh, but although that means the people who originally lent the money will be getting 6%, if anybody's thinking of buying any of these debentures on the uh, stock exchange, well, what matters to them is how much would they be getting each year based on how much they have to invest. So the interest yield is the coupon rate, the interest, as a percentage of the market value. So here in the two years, in 2002, well, the interest on $100 nominal The interest is the coupon rate from step to financial position is $6. On the market value, 2002, the market value is 110. And so anybody thinking of buying these debentures on the uh, stock exchange would be getting a return year by year of 5.45%. And that's what they'll look at in deciding in whether it's worth investing. Is that more or less than the percentage they could get elsewhere? Uh, what about 2001? Last year, the interest was still 6% of nominal. The market value was 118. And so last year, when people were thinking whether to buy them or not, 6 on 118, they'd have been getting 5.08%. Now, you can't really compare these uh, because you'll see in later chapters it's the investor who fixes the market value and the return, they'd be very much comparing with what they can get elsewhere. You see, maybe uh, last year banks were giving 4%. Ah, these debentures would be very attractive. You put your money there, you'd get 5%. Uh, this year, obviously, banks may be paying more or less interest. Interest rates don't stay constant. And so, again, this year, you'd be comparing the 5.45 with interest you can get elsewhere when considering whether or not it was worth investing. Uh, the other section says shareholder ratios. Well, the first isn't really a ratio, and this should be no problem, but dividend per share... All these ratios, the share ratios, it's ordinary shares we're interested in. So dividend per share, it's, well, sorry, I shouldn't need to write down. Well, I'm not going to write down, but it's a dividend per share. So it's total dividend divided by the number of shares. Um, 2002, the total ordinary dividend was 20,000. How many ordinary shares were there? Be careful, I mentioned this in the first lecture for this chapter. Although it says 60,000 on the step to financial position, they're 10 cents shares. So to arrive at 60,000, there must be 600,000 shares. And therefore, the dividend per share. I could have chosen nicer figures, but it's not 0.33. It's 3.3 cents per share. Uh, what was it last year? Uh, last year, the total dividend to ordinary shareholders was 15,000. Uh, um, uh, the number of shares was still 600,000. 
And so last year the dividend of the share was 0.025. So I think it's fairly obvious why shareholders are interested. Clearly, the more dividend of the share, generally speaking, uh, the happier they'll be. Uh, dividend cover is defined as being the earnings available to ordinary shareholders divided by uh, the dividend to the ordinary shareholders. So again, let's look at the two years. In 2002, the earnings available, well, the earnings, the profit after tax was 34,000. But out of that, they have to pay a preference dividend of 2,800. So the maximum available for ordinary shareholders is the difference of 31,200. Divide it by the dividend actually given to the ordinary shareholders of 20,000. And the dividend cover, uh, again, 31,200 available divided by 20,000 is 1.56. Generally, we leave that just as a, a number. Uh, whereas in 2001, Uh, the profits after tax were 33. Out of that, 2,800 would have to go to preference. So again, only the balance is available for ordinary shareholders. The dividend to ordinary 15,000. So the dividend cover the amount available 30,200 divided by 15,000 was 2.01. So arithmetically that's it. Uh, why are shareholders interested? They're interested in two reasons. For two reasons. Firstly, it gives them an indication of how easy it is for the business to actually pay them this level of dividend. How likely it will continue in the future. Um, it's fallen, but if it fell very low, you know, if the dividend cover was 1.1 or something, I think they'd be very worried because it would only need a small fall in profits next year to result in lower dividends. Uh, here, 1.56, I mean, there's no perfect level, but they can afford the profit next year to, to fall a fair amount before they're going to lose the dividend. So it's a question of how confident are they that you know, they can maintain the dividend in the future. Uh, the other reason is that the higher that figure is, the more the business is retaining. You know, last year they retained 15,200, this year only 11,200. Why does the business retain? They retain to expand the uh, company, rather than pay out all the cash as dividend, keep some back to buy more machines to expand. So the more they're retaining, the more we'd expect they'll be expanding, and the more they expand, hopefully the more profit in the future. So that's dividend cover. Dividend yield? Again, um, we only look at this for ordinary shareholders, but it's the dividend per share as a percentage of the market value per share. Let's check the numbers and then um, see the relevance of it. In 2002, the dividend per share <coughs> to ordinary shareholders, well, it, it was 20,000 
Oh, sorry, we've worked out a... Yeah, there is some. I'm going to work it out again. We did it earlier. It was 0 0.033. The market value per share 2002, the ordinary shares again, was 0.83 dollars. And so, in percentage terms, I get 3.98%. Whereas in 2001, the dividend per share, where was it? 0 0.0025. Uh, divided by the market value per share in 2001, ordinary shares were 72. Which was 3.47%. Now, two things here. First of all, I think you can see why a shareholder might be interested and why this is printed in the newspapers. But, you know, in 2002, if you are thinking of buying some shares on the stock exchange, you're paying 83, dividend 3 cents. Ah, it's like getting interest at 3.98%, previous year 3.47%. However, it's of little actual use. You see, dividend yields tend to be a lot lower than interest rates at the bank. If I told you the banks are paying interest of 5%, then why on earth would anybody buy a share in 2002 and pay 83 cents if you're only going to get 3.98%? And the reason is, of course, uh, if you put money in the bank and it's 5%, it's sort of a fixed 5%, you buy shares. And of course, you're hoping that the dividend in future years will increase. You're hoping that the market value will increase and you'll get a capital gain. So you're thinking about the future. Um, this measure, you're simply looking at this year's dividend. You're ignoring the fact that in future, hopefully, dividends will be a lot higher and market value will go up. Uh, next one. Earnings per share. This you should be happy about from earlier exams, but again, it's only ordinary shareholders. The earnings per share, um, it's the profit available for ordinary shareholders. Divided by the number of shares. Sorry, my writing could be a bit better, but never mind. So, 2002, the profit available. The profit was 34,000, but preference dividend 2,800. So that's the profit available, divided by the number of ordinary shares. 2002, there was 600,000. And so 34,000 minus 2,800 divided by 600,000, 0.052, so 5.2 cents per share. Uh, 2001, profit 33,000, minus preference dividend 2.8. Uh, there were still 600,000 shares in issue. 33,000 minus 2,800. I get 0.050, 03. Fine. Uh, this is of interest because, um, remember, for, um, businesses may pay higher or lower dividends 
not because necessarily they've made more or less profit, but it depends how much they choose to retain to keep within the business. And so you can have the situation where the dividend per share falls, but it's not because the profit has fallen, it's because they've chosen to do more investing. Uh, and so earnings per share is terribly relevant, but clearly we want, uh, shareholders want the earnings per share to increase each year. That's much more important to them than the, what the company decides to do about dividends. Uh, finally, oh sorry, beg your pardon. If you think back to dividend cover, I'm not going to repeat the calculations, but the dividend cover, uh, we did in total earlier on, do appreciate, you can either do it in total or per share, the earnings, you can either do total earnings divided by total dividend, or earnings per share divided by dividend per share. Uh, check back, do it yourself, but apart possibly from roundings, you'll end up with exactly the same figures for the dividend cover. Uh, finally, one of the most important measures on the page, and something that gets is relevant in questions time and time and time again, is the price earnings or the P-E ratio. This one is desperately important. The arithmetic, as you'll see, is easy, just learn it, but also appreciate the significance of it. Uh, the P ratio is the market value of ordinary shares divided by the earnings per share. In 2002, the market value per share, given in the question, was 83 cents. The earnings per share, I calculated a moment ago, 0 0.052. And therefore, arithmetically, the P ratio, 83 divided by I want two is fifty. Well, don't so place it sixteen. Uh, in two thousand and one, the uh, market value per share was seventy two. The earnings per share point zero five, and so the PE ratio. Fourteen point four. So arithmetically easy, but I do need to say a few words about this. It is so important. It's printed in the newspapers. But what's the relevance of the P ratio? You know, last year people were prepared to pay fourteen times the earnings. This year. If they're buying on the stock exchange, they're prepared to pay 16 times the earnings. It does mean, very loosely, that this year, it will take 16 years to get back the investment based on current earnings. It's the market value divided by the current earnings per share. So based on current earnings, Anybody buying a share on a stock exchange in this company this year, based on current earnings, it would take them 16 years to get the money back. Suppose I showed you another company which had a P ratio of 40. If 
That would mean, based on their current earnings, it would take 40 years for somebody to get the money back. So why on earth would anybody buy shares in this company if it's going to take 40 years? When they could buy in our company, it'll only take them 16 years. The reason is, you see, the P ratio is calculated on current earnings. What determines how much you'll pay for a share is what you expect in the future. And if you expect that a company is going to grow a lot in the future, you'll pay a lot more for a share than you would for a company where it's not going to grow very much. People buying a share in that company don't really think it would take them 40 years to get the money back. They're paying a lot more for the share because they think that company is going to grow a lot more. And that's the relevance of the P ratio. Higher P ratio. Uh, means that uh, shareholders are expecting higher future growth. You know, I remember companies like Amazon, you know, that sells books, they had a P ratio of 2,000. You know, in years gone by. We didn't mean people were expecting, investors were expecting it would take 2,000 years to get the money back. They never have bought them. It's because they were expecting the earnings to grow so much. The more growth they expected, the more they were prepared to pay. Uh, they were hoping to get the money back a lot sooner than 2,000 years. But that's why it is so important. The higher the PE, the more growth they're expecting. Uh, and what determines the growth depends very much on the type of business. You know, some businesses, some types of business, there's a lot of growth. Those companies you'd expect to have high PE ratios. Other types of business grow a lot less. They'll have lower P ratios. We'd want to compare our P ratio with similar companies. If ours are higher than the average for our company, it looks as though Shell's expect we'll do a lot better. If ours are lower than P's for similar companies, it suggests that they think you know, we're managing the company badly. All right, that was a lot of chat. I've gone on for a long time, but we'll leave that one there. There's one more chapter relating to sources of finance, and then we'll get back to pure numbers, how we actually work out market values.